Start with the introductory remarks. I'm uh, Josh Busby, an associate professor here at the LBJ School. Uh, delighted that all of you can join us today for this uh, co-sponsored event between the LBJ School, the Clement Center, and the Strauss Center, so a trifecta of sponsors. There will also be another event tomorrow uh, on a book from uh, Stuart Patrick on Sovereignty Wars uh, at the same time in this space. So come back for uh, a piece uh, of uh, another talk tomorrow. But I I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Cullen Hendricks, who's an associate professor at the University of Denver at the Corbell School and also a non-resident fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Has a number of other affiliations, uh, having worked with the Brooklyn Stability Task Force, among other. Uh, and he's a longtime collaborator uh, and known to us here at LBJ. We've worked together on the Climate Change and African Political Stability Program, a five year effort that was funded by the Pentagon uh, under its Minerva Initiative. And I don't know, uh, maybe 10 years ago, when, or almost 10 years ago, when we were thinking about that project, I, I met Cullen at a conference in 2005 in Norway uh, and thought, this is one of the smartest guys I've met. We need to have him and his collaborator, Aideen Salahian, on our research team for this uh, project. And we were fortunate that they uh, joined us. And as part of that, they were the uh, instigators uh, and creators of the Social Conflict in Africa database, now the Social Conflict Analysis Database, which has extended its work to coverage of some countries in Latin America. And it's an award-winning database that's helped us have a portrait of social conflict in the world, uh, protests, riots, and strikes, and is amazing work. Uh, uh, Dr. Hendricks is one of the most uh, prodigious uh, uh, producers of really smart work on uh, climate change, security, food, and security, and sort of political economy and security. So we're really <laughs> fortunate to have him here today. And wow. I've assigned uh, so much of his uh, work in my ongoing environmental security uh, class that um, I'm s uh, super enthused that he was able to not only join the class this morning, but come today and talk to you about his work on the streetlight effect in climate change research on Africa. So without further ado, Colin. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Josh. Thanks to the Clements and Strauss Centers for the opportunity to be here today. Um, Josh already told you a little bit about how it is that we came to be collaborators and work together uh, in this space, uh, researching climate change uh, and political stability, particularly in the context of Africa. Um, I'm actually going to return to that story because, believe it or not, how we met, and in particular, the influence of that meeting and the human networks that that activated is a big part of an opportunity, certainly for me in terms of my career, uh, the, my work with the Strauss Center here was, was really career changing. I think my mom, who's class of 67 at UT Austin, would be very proud of the work that I did here <laughs> at the Strauss Center. Um, but it also is emblematic of a problem, a problem that when I went looking for it in my own research, I found was pretty significant, and a problem that when I went looking for it in other areas of research, be it in human adaptations uh, and responses to climate change, or the links between climate change and political stability, or the links between climate change, agriculturally led development, agricultural economics, uh, and uh, climate change and a host of other issues, I kept seeing this same problem emerge. And that problem is something that I'm calling the streetlight effect uh, more broadly. And today I'll be talking about a more narrow piece of that, which is the streetlight effect in climate change research on Africa. So I want to start today with three observations. And these observations are not so much about any particular empirical phenomena. They are about a problem that bedevils us as scientists of a variety of sorts that we almost never talk about. And that's simply this. First, what we know about climate change effects and adaptation thereto is only as good and as generalizable as the cases that we know about. What that means is that our knowledge of climate change impacts and adaptation, indeed our knowledge of virtually any phenomenon, is inherently limited by the cases that we know about. And our ability to generalize from those cases that we know to those contexts that we don't know as well is limited in ways uh, that are embodied in the way social scientists talk about this in a concept called scope conditions. In more general kind of parlance, what it means is if we've only studied country X and the way a phenomenon inter interacts with country X, we can't say much about how that affects country Y. 
All right, so that's the first observation. The second observation is that humans are creatures of habit and convenience. And although it may not be immediately evident, the social scientists and climate scientists working in this area are in fact human, which means that they are <laughs> creatures of habit and convenience. We take advantage of opportunities that are comfortable, that are easy, that are familiar to us. All of that's fine. But the latter inherently places limits on the former. And these are limits that as social scientists we tend not to acknowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what I'm calling the streetlight effect. Now why am I calling it the streetlight effect? It's because it's related to kind of an old, I guess it's, it's a parable of sorts, <laughs> that is typically used to illustrate this phenomenon. And it typically works like this. So uh, this gentleman has been spending a little bit too much time on 6th, right? And he's kind of <laughs> maybe a little bit overserved, and he's walking down the street and he drops his wallet. Uh, this is a, a, an adage from another time because a kindly police officer sees him wandering around the street and finally sees him, you know, uh, milling about underneath the street light. And the police officer comes over and says, excuse me, sir, you know, what's going on? How can I help you? And, and the man says, well, I, I lost my wallet. The police officer says to him, well, where did you lose it? He says, well, I don't know, you know, I was in the Jackalope, I was in this other place, I was in a room. I've been up and down the street. He says, okay, well, fine, so given that you've been to all these different places, why are you looking here? And the man responds, well, this is where the light is. Okay? This is related to a human tendency to look for answers in places that are convenient, not necessarily answers in places that will give us the best, most reliable information for confronting problems. As that pertains to social science and climate science, it's the tendency to focus on particular cases, variables, and questions for reasons of convenience <coughs> rather than what we might consider to be more valid reasons. You know, broader relevance, construct validity, how well a variable or an idea maps onto a theoretical construct, or policy import. We go for what's convenient as opposed to those things that might be more important to us. This creates bias in our body of knowledge. And this is true even if the individual studies that we undertake are unbiased. We know more about certain phenomena and certain places than we know about others. And this is really problematic for the policy audiences and indeed for the general public who are consumers of our output, who are relying on us to generate reliable, interesting, novel information that can help them better understand the world in which they're operating and better understand the problems that they face and what solutions to those problems might look like. Um, this is a really kind of very, I think, hopefully easy to understand illustration. This is a map that was published in the British Medical Journal in 2005. And what it shows is the geographic distribution of all of the randomized controlled trials. Right? So this is kind of the gold standard in the design of a clinical study of AIDS and HIV-related interventions conducted across Africa from the period beginning of the 1980s and going up to 2003. Now, if you know much about African geography, and in particular African colonial history and its interaction with current geography, what you'll notice is that these studies are overwhelmingly clustered in Anglophone former British colonial Africa. Right? In fact, right, this is Ghana here, former British colony. As of 2003, when the authors put this together, we as a scientific community knew as much about AIDS and HIV interventions in Ghana as we knew about Francophone Africa. So hundreds of millions of people combined. All right, and I'm going to talk about why that might be the case and demonstrate that that same pattern replicates itself in the study of climate change uh, impacts and uh, interventions. All right, the nature and size of this bias is unknown. That's unfortunate. I wish I had a great diagnostic where I could solve this problem for you. Today, my, my ambition is simply to alert you that this problem exists and that maybe collectively, especially those of you in the room who are students, are going to be the next generation of people who are interrogating these kinds of issues, we can come up with some solutions collaboratively. All right. Why does the streetlight effect exist? Well, in large part, it's driven by very practical kinds of concerns. So I, Cullen Hendricks, am interested in studying the impacts of climate change on uh, the lake ecosystems uh, of sub-Saharan Africa. 
where am I going to go to do that kind of work? You know, what are some things that I might consider? Well, presumably, I'd like to know how to communicate with the people that I find there, even if I'm going to be taking tree ring samples or you know, engaging in a, in, a, in a drag or gill net survey so that I can, I can pick up fish samples. All right? I'm going to want to have language skills that are relevant for interacting with the local community. I'm also going to be concerned about safety and the permissiveness of political inquiry. All things being equal, I would probably like to work in a context in which I do not feel like I am putting myself at significant personal harm, and that it's a context in which the open discussion of ideas, collection of data, uh, the surveying of respondents uh, and, and members of the local community, is all done in a, essentially an open and permissive environment. I'm also going to be c considering the ease of travel and personal connections. How am I going to identify the appropriate contacts, uh, contacts for conducting my study? Um, I'm going to be interested in the availability of secondary sources. Has there been a lot written on this subject in the past so that I can leverage the stock of human knowledge to inform my study? And then finally, the availability of data. Are there already data in place that can support my analysis? Now, those of you who are, who are probably familiar with this sort of general class of issues that arise uh, in scientific inquiry have heard of the concept of a data hole. Right? So a country for which no relevant data are collected. Um, this, is a, this is a figure not put together by me, obviously, uh, that's entitled The Unmeasured World. And what you see here, it's, a heat, uh, it's essentially a, a heat map that is going from very low, uh, low uh, white indicates that there are virtually no data collected for this particular um, political entity. Uh, red means that there are virtually, uh, there's virtually full coverage, uh, and I think this is the world development indicators data uh, for that country. And what we see is that there's very, very, very uneven coverage across countries. For most of the OECD, so the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, in the United States, essentially the, the global north, data is relatively easy to come by. Uh, for many of the countries of the Global South, it's more difficult to come by. Indeed, for some of entities like Somalia, for instance, there's vir there are virtually no systematic data that are collected on an annual basis, published uh, in easy-to-access formats for people to use to inform their comparative analysis in order for, for researchers to compare uh, Somalia to other places. Now, there are still intrepid researchers who work in Somalia right, on issues related to governance on issues related to conflict, but also on issues related to natural resource management and impacts and adaptations of climate change. They're doing so at considerable risk to themselves. Uh, and this is of no kind of small interest to me because my wife is one of them. Mm -hmm. Alright? But there are not a lot of people working in these areas simply because for all of the reasons I've outlined earlier, ease of travel, la la language issues, uh, safety and permissiveness of, of scientific inquiry, these are, this is a difficult place to work. And because it's a difficult place to work, on margin, scientists decide not to work there. Right? And that matters for our total stock of knowledge. All right, so those are the practical kind of reasons. There are also some reasons related to the inside baseball of academic and scientific employment. So my audience for this talk for about the next two minutes is going to shrink considerably because it's only directly relevant for those of you who are trying to get kind of tenure or seek employment in academic institutions or build a reputation as a scientist. But bear with me. This inside baseball is important because it's one of the mechanisms by which this problem propagates itself. For purely professional reasons, academics and researchers face pretty significant professional incentives to focus on those cases that are already studied, already well understood, and around which there's already a large scientific literature. Those cases, questions, and problems. And that's simply because if you want to get hired, you need to be saying something that other people are interested in. It's really straightforward. If you think about it, 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 it's an issue that kind of permeates and pervades virtually every aspect of our lives. We want to communicate. We want there to be an audience for the things that we have to say. And if you focus on well-known, well-understood cases, you are instantly going to be able to access a much larger audience than you otherwise might. And that also increases the likelihood that the people who are in charge of hiring young researchers are going to be interested in what you do. All right? It also allows you to build off of and talk to already established famous studies in these various disciplines. Okay? 
And all of that matters for whether or not you get hired, whether or not you get fellowships, whether or not you get promoted, whether or not you get tenure, and whether or not eventually you do enough of this stuff so that your friends that you met a decade earlier will invite you back to their campus so you can tell people about the systematic problems in everything that they're doing, including themselves. So, yeah. Okay, um, anyway. Right, so I've, I've posed this as a problem, and, and, and for a specific kind of a discussion today, I'm going to pose it specifically as a problem uh, in opposition to what we might consider would be the best case model of the kinds of cases uh, and places that would, that would capture scholarly attention. So I call this kind of the need-based or kind of Benthamite uh, model of scholarly interest. And that is a, a model of scholarly interest that is designed to do the greatest good for the greatest number. This is need-based. So what we would think would drive case selection for studies related to adaptation uh, to the effects of climate change, which is our, our subject for today, what are some things that we think might drive us to focus on particular African cases? And this is true of, of the whole world, of course, but, but I'm focusing kind of narrowly on Africa, uh, in part because that's what we got money to, to study in the first place, right? Um, well, I would argue that probably we would think that from this Benthamite logic, we would want to study more populous countries or at least devote more attention to more populous countries, because all things being equal, a study on Nigeria has the potential to illuminate uh, the conditions of the lives of hundreds of millions of people, whereas the same study on Equatorial Guinea would only illuminate the conditions of maybe a million, a million and a half people. Now that's not nothing, right? But it, it would suggest that we would, on, on, on average, we would expect that more populous countries would receive more attention. I would also say that this model of scholarly interest would lead us to focus on poorer countries. And that's because poorer countries have fewer resources to invest in adaptation and are going to be more reliant on researchers and funders from abroad to meet their needs in terms of designing adaptations uh, to address a, a future change in climate. Uh, and then finally, uh, countries that are more rural and more kind of agriculturally dependent. We might think that that's important. We might also think that exposure, physical exposure to climate change would be an important determinant. It's not the case, while, while, the case, while it is the case that, that most of our climate change scenarios uh, <coughs> suggest that the future for most of Africa will be one of increasingly erratic rainfall in many regions, lower rainfall in many regions, higher temperatures. It's not the case that these impacts are uniform across the continent. Some countries, Madagascar, for instance, which has a lot of low-lying coastal area, is much more exposed uh, than perhaps Uganda, for instance. All right, so these are all things that we think would fit into a kind of a Benthamite sort of model of scholarly inquiry. The greatest good for the, those with the greatest need, and the greatest number of those in the need. We can contrast that with what I would say is the convenience or the capacity based, because I don't want to think it only sounds as if this has to do with it also has to do with just the ability to conduct inquiry in the first place, types of uh, factors that would affect targeting. So one of them is just these issues I've already highlighted, low barriers to, in, uh, to entry. We would probably, under this model, go to places where the permissibility of free inquiry is high, where we can talk to local scientists, where we can talk to local populations, and not fear that we are putting those people in harm's way because they are talking to a scientist or a researcher from the outside. Uh, and also places where there's rel relatively low potential for the researcher of the study to be endangered or complicated by instability or violence. And then finally, it builds on and reacts to this existing literature. All right? These are two different models. And the good news is, is that there's support for both of these models. The bad news is, is that there's almost as much support for this model as there is for this model. <coughs> And that's a problem. Again, it's a problem of magnitude about which we're still a little uncertain, but it's definitely a problem. So what's the biggest contributor so far? Um, across a host of issue areas, climate change being the one I'll show you the most evidence for today, but also in the field of security studies, uh, and in the fields of agricultural economics, and in the uh, field of randomized controlled experiments for development, um, the biggest contributor to this is English. Do they speak English there? That's because Engu English sort of, I guess, um, and paradoxically, is the lingua franca of scientific discourse in the 20th and 21st centuries. 
If you want to, your research to have an impact, you need to publish it, or you have the best chance of publishing, of it having an impact if it's published in English. It's the language of the U US and the UK. These are the two dominant powers of the 19th, 20th, and so far the 21st century. They're the ones who have funded the most systematic uh, research and inquiry about the world around them. They also have extensive uh, colonial and sort of, sort of, or neo-colonial ties with many parts of the world, which means that their researchers have been active in, in, uh, in, in the world, interacting with these former colonies uh, throughout this time period, under which we've, we've come to develop a body of literature around climate change, which is essentially from the late 1980s to the present. Um, what does this mean? We study places where we can leverage our existing networks, and we study places where we can speak English while doing it. And we publish research, moreover, we publish research by developing world scholars from former British colonies. And the reason there is not because they're any smarter, and is probably not even because they're better educated. It's simply because they have the, the language skills to write and engage in scientific communication in the language that is dominant from the broader perspective of the scientific community. And I can, I, can, I can go a little bit deeper with some of these issues in the Q&A, but for, for now, I think I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so I would, and I'll, I'll I'll motivate this a little bit by, by telling you my own story. So this is actually where it relates to the, to the very kind introduction that Josh gave me earlier. All right, so I'm going to tell you about how it is that I came to work in Uganda. How many of you are familiar with Uganda? How many of you have actually been to Uganda? Okay, a few of you have. Like there were some in the, in the, cl in the class earlier um, when, I, when I had the chance to speak to Dr. Busby's class who or also have experience working in Uganda as well. Now. I could tell you a very interesting story about how it is that I came to work in terms of my field work in the, right, in the Pearl of Africa. I could tell you a very interesting story about its colonial history. I could tell you an interesting story about the uh, continued relevance of its pre-colonial institutions. I could tell you a very interesting story about patterns of conflict there. As a security scholar, I'm very interested in that. I could tell you a lot about the importance of the coffee uh, and tea export economies there and the effects that climate change will have for that. And I can actually tell you now, uh, via my collaboration with my wife, a surprising amount about the lake ecosystem uh, it enjoys. And I could tell you that all of those things were the reason why I came to study Uganda. That would be a nice story. It would be a complete lie. <laughs> okay. Now, all of those things happen to be true. They simply are not relevant for how it is that I wound up studying. Okay? So it doesn't undermine necessarily the enterprise in which I'm engaged, but it does suggest that I came to be engaged in it for reasons that have virtually nothing to do with a host of those issues, or at least no direct link to all of those issues I just outlined. So how did it happen? Well, uh, myself uh, and this guy, this, these pictures are more recent, we were much younger men at that point, I mean Selekian at the University of North Texas, were interested uh, in the impacts of climate change for political instability and conflict. We were fortunate to meet and interact with, with Josh at a conference in 2005 in Oslo, after which he invited us to participate in a grant-funded project, the CCAPS project, the Climate Change and African Political Stability Project. It was a career and life changing experience. And it all hinged on the fact that we, I guess we got along reasonably well in Oslo. Um, this, is, this is how this stuff works. If you start asking, let me, let me finish the story, but I will just say right now, ask your professors how it is that they came to work in the places that they work. And if they're being honest with you, you will get some variation of this kind of story. All right. So, wow, we got all this money to go study climate change and political stability in Africa but we didn't know where we would go to do our field work, primarily because Idina and I are not field work oriented in the main social scientists. We tend to collect data from afar uh, and then conduct statistical analysis. Well, that inter uh, man by the name of Mark Cutright, who's an education professor at the University of North Texas, whose work happened to be conducted in Uganda. And he pitched us on Uganda as a place to conduct scientific inquiry for a variety of the reasons I outlined earlier. It was a place where we could speak English, where there, was, where, where, where there were already existing networks that we could leverage. And while there was political instability, which is an outcome that we cared about in that specific grant project, it was political stability that was confined to areas at that time which were not likely to directly affect the research that we were doing. 
On a parallel track, uh, my wife Sarah Glasser, who's a fish biologist, was working with and, and made contact with a man by the name of Les Kaufman. Les Kaufman is a fish biologist who's been working in the Lake Victoria ecosystem for about 40 years at this point. He did some of the, the pioneering work on uh, the study of cichlids, which are a type of fish. You see them in aquariums a lot in the United States, in Lake Victoria. They're considered the Darwin's finches of the aquatic world. They tell us almost everything we know uh, about, or originally came to know about speciation and evolution of, of small fishes, okay? Um, the two, she came along with us on one of these research visits, and while she was there, she made uh, contact with this man, Dr. John Balirwa, who is the director of the National Fisheries Research and Resources Institute in Uganda, based in Jinja. And via that, hope, that, that set of relationships, we then put into the field a couple of National Science Foundation uh, funded projects related to food security, climate change, uh, and the lake itself. And we've actually taken our students there. These are three students I've taught at William & Mary, a couple of whom are actually in graduate school, and a couple of whom are studying uh, development and water issues in sub-Saharan Africa. Can any of you in the room guess what are some of the countries that they're studying, or what is the main countries that they're studying? <laughs> right, because this is, the, this is the process by which this, this initial kind of, the, these, these, these initial decisions propagate themselves. These are the places we take our students to work, and these are the systems that they become interested in. And that doesn't make us bad people. In fact, I think it makes us pretty good people, but it also makes us human. We are creatures of convenience and we are creatures of habit, and this conditions how we conduct our own work. Okay, so that's the true story of how all of that occurred. Now again, it doesn't, it doesn't obviate and it doesn't render moot all of the things I told you about why Uganda is interesting from a social, scientific, and from a scientific perspective, but it does give you a much more kind of realistic picture of what motivated the inquiry in the first place. Okay. Um, now, it probably matters more for some types of subjects than it does for others. Uh, for instance, if you're doing a tree ring study, right, um, the tree certainly doesn't care whether or not the territory that it was, that, on which it's growing was colonized by Great Britain or France in the 19th century. It doesn't matter a lot for it. But it probably matters for forestry policy. Or at least it may matter for forestry policy, seeing as forestry policy is implemented and, and, and designed and produced by institutions that bear that French or Anglophone British colonial legacy. Similarly, the individual fish, these are the dog, they're small, they don't taste very good, but they're very high in um, uh, um, aminos and, and uh, trans fats. So they are not trans fats, they're, 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 they're very useful if you grind them up for making baby forms. Okay. It's been a while. I've been out of the baby formula game for some time, so I can't exactly what, what exactly makes it good about it. The point is, it's one of the fisheries that, that underutilized fisheries in Lake Victoria. Um, again, it probably doesn't that matter necessarily for the fish as an organism, if you want to understand them from, from, or, or, from that perspective. But it does matter if you're interested in fisheries governance. It does matter if you think that it is easier, easier to co-manage these transboundary fisheries uh, in countries where you have a British colonial heritage and shared British colonial institutions <coughs> than in those contexts where these fisheries are either located in a Francophone or Lusophone country or are being co-managed by countries with different colonial heritages. And so what that means is that it might not matter for the organisms itself, but it certainly, I think, matters for the way that these organisms are governed. Anything that is interacting very explicitly with the social, political, demographic, and economic context in which it's occurring is likely to be affected by this true line effect. All right, um, so that's kind of the argument. Let me tell you a little bit about the evidence that I've generated. So how would you go about thinking about measuring what it is that we as a scientific community are interested in? It's not immediately intuitive that there would be a solution. And probably 15 years or even 10 years ago, there wasn't a great solution. Uh, thankfully, our overlords at Google came up with one. It's called Google Scholar. Google Scholar indexes virtually all of the scientific literature, in addition to gray literature, so policy reports, uh, and books. And via Google Scholar searches, we can get information about those cases and countries that receive more attention than others. All right, so here we have a, a kind of a sample search. 
So here I'm searching in a, in a journal called Global Environmental Change. It's one of the key journals in the discussion about the human uh, impacts and adaptations to climate change for Kenya. And there are 406 results, which means that uh, there have been maybe 12 additional studies published since uh, I published the data that you're going to see in the presentation a little bit later. I also picked Global Environmental Change because that's the journal that published the paper that, on which this, uh, <laughs> this, this talk is based. So, um, Having said that, I conducted these searches systematically across a host of journals, across Google Scholar in general, uh, and, and then uh, across a, a variety of different issue areas. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, some of them focused specifically on journals related to climate change. Some of them focused on journals related to agricultural economics and development economics. And some of them are related to security-oriented journals. Because again, one of the things that was motivating this entire uh, um, project initially was whether or not climate change was going to be an accelerant of political instability in Africa. Okay, I can obviously answer any kind of technical questions you have about that, but we we'll maybe save that for a little bit later. All right, so what's my modeling framework? Well, my dependent variable here are references to studies indexed on Google Scholar. I look at both total mentions, right, so it's indexed across all publications, You're just literally typing in climate change as a, as a single operator, and then the names of the various countries. I, addressing the fact that there are permutations of these different names, so that was a little data hiccup. And my RAs did, did really great work to help me with solving that. And then also in these more focused journals, Global Environmental Change, Climatic Change, and the Nature of Climate Change. These are three journals that are, that are almost entirely dedicated to, uh, to publishing research on, human, uh, on the impacts of and human adaptations to climate change. There are others, but these are relatively representative of the climate change literature. And we, we collect the data both on general mentions, that's just did the name come up anywhere in the study, and on title mentions. And the reason that we collected mentions in the title is simply because we can presume from that that this study is much more focused on the particular case, that that case is getting more extensive treatment than it would if the name just came up in passing in the study. Okay. Um, and then I, I, I use the information uh, that was uh, collected there to also uh, use a measurement model uh, using factor analysis to create a latent measure of interest. And if any of you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to come back to it a little bit later. It's simply a way of trying to collapse all of that information into a single variable that gives us some sense of, relatively speaking, how much scholarly interest does a particular country generate vis-a-vis -vis other countries in the data. All right, so I then include a variety of independent variables. So first I'll talk about the need base. So this is these are, these are variables that are expected to affect the volume of scholarly interest operating or emanating from this kind of Benthamite greatest good for the greatest number for those who need the help the most kind of model. And the variables that are in, in the analysis here are population, GDP per capita. So population should be associated with more scholarly interest. GDP per capita should be associated negatively. Land area, I expect it would be associated with more scholarly interest simply because there are, there are more ecosystems and more territory affected. And then I include a measure of climate change exposure. This is taken from uh, Notre Dame's GAIN project. And it's a composite indicator that is designed to capture the overall physical effects of climate change, not accounting for adaptive capacity. So it's simply, how much do we think climate change is going to affect your physical environment in the future? And then I've included uh, these other convenience or capacity-based measures. Is the country a former British colony? That's our proxy for whether or not you can speak English while you're there, and whether or not you can leverage research networks that extend back into uh, the colonial period. I also included a measure of Freedom House Civil Liberties score. The higher the score on that variable, the more free inquiry and free speech are curtailed. So we would expect that the higher that that goes, the less scholarly interest there would be. And I also included the standard deviation of the polity score. Now, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole of telling what the polity score is, but suffice it to say that as that value goes up, that means that you have more changes in the nature of the regime. You have switching from democracy to autocracy, you have <coughs> governments going out of power, new governments coming into power, alternation in power irregularly and frequently. So it's intended to capture whether or not there's a context of political stability. 
And my unit of analysis here is country, and then there's also supplementary analysis I won't be showing today that's done at the country decade level. And my models are simply ordinary least squares with uh, robust standard errors. I don't get the sense that this audience is too worried about the econometric specification, but if you have questions about it, I'd be happy to get into it a little bit later. We don't really need modeling to tell us that this is an issue, however, because the eyeball test, when you look at the raw data, is already indicative of the fact that there's pretty significant bias towards these former Anglo countries. Right, if we look, these are the top 10 African countries ranked by scholarly attention, according to these various measures. Across them, countries like South Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya, and Ghana to a lesser extent, dominate. So these are these are former Anglophone, these are Anglophone <coughs> former British colonies, African countries. Now some of them are large too, so we would expect, for instance, Kenya would get, or excuse me, Nigeria would get a lot of attention because almost 200 people, 200 million people live in Nigeria. Um, but the multivariate analysis, uh, which I'll go through really quickly, just suggests that most of the indicators, other than population and to a lesser extent land area that I thought we proxy need, don't matter. It is the case that across the board, more populous countries get more scholarly attention, but the evidence is not particularly large and strong in magnitude. On the other hand, those variables that proxy capacity and convenience, those variables that we think would affect kind of the permissibility and the ease of doing research there, are very, very strong predictors of the volume of scholarly interest that the country receives. Um, I wasn't quite sure the, uh, the kind of audience. So this is a regression table. I'm dying right now because it's an absolutely terrible way to present evidence to a mixed audience. I'll get to some graphical evidence here quickly. Um, it's not just a problem for climate change research. It's a problem for agricultural economics research too. Slightly different model specification because different things might matter for agricultural research than for climate change impacts and adaptation. Same story. Former British colonies that are more politically open and more politically stable receive more scholarly. Um, and uh, this will give you a, a little bit of a sense of the magnitude. So this is, um, this is actually looking at a subset of research in agricultural economics. This is looking at data derived um, from the uh, Poverty Action Laboratory at MIT, which is a clearinghouse for the registration of uh, randomized controlled trials for development studies. These are people, mostly economists, who are going out and conducting these gold standard types of studies that are intended to provide evidentiary basis for informing policy, if you're familiar with, with j Powell's efforts. All the individual research is incredibly carefully done, but as I mentioned earlier, it is biased in terms of the types of countries that it's occurring in. And this just gives you a sense of how large that, that bias is. There's, there aren't a ton of these studies, so the average country in any given, de uh, in any given time period uh, would not necessarily receive very many. So if it's a former British colony, we think on average holding the effects of everything else constant. Um, a former British colony might be the subject uh, in a given kind of country decade of let, maybe half a study, all right? So every other non-former British colony. Whereas the former British colonies receive sort of essentially three times as much scholarly interest. Uh, for those of you who are interested in sort of the security impacts of climate change, actually, I can put a much more human face on the nature of this type of bias. What we have here, again, is a different model specification, but the same kind of outcome variable. We're looking at the volume of scholarly interest. This is in one journal. I'm currently collecting data. We do this for a variety of security and conflict-oriented journals. This is just for references uh, to these types of studies in the journal, Journal of Peace Research. I'm picking on it for two reasons. One, um, because it's one of the leading journals in this field, and two, because in doing so, I'm actually picking on myself because I'm on the editorial team there. So I'm not saying anything that I wouldn't say to them as well. This is a problem for us. Um, and what we have here are predicted counts, uh, uh, a predicted number of studies published in this journal <coughs> on um, essentially conflict, dyna on conflict dynamics that reference climate change. Right, so these are studies in that journal by country that reference climate change. Um, and the difference between them is statistically significant for all of these values. But, but let me, again, like I said, try to put a human face on that. This red line indicates the equivalence. Uh, the black dots are not former British colonies, and the gray dots are former British colonies. Um, what this suggests, because this is log normalized, so I can, I can show you 
in real numbers, what this suggests, is that in order to generate the same volume of scholarly interest around climate change and conflict dynamics as one death over the period 1989 to 2016 in a former British colony, roughly 150 people need to die to generate an equivalent amount of scholarly interest in a non-formal British country. So I'm not, ta I mean, what I have been talking about is a little bit about scientific and inside baseball, and that's fine, but it does have a human face when you think about it in these terms. All right, so I ran through a lot of evidence there. Hopefully the argument made some intuitive sense um, I'm still working through evidence in some of these areas, some of it's been published, but this is a real problem. And it's a real problem I'm not sure how to solve. Now, again, I want to return to just a couple more observations before I end my, my formal comments. One of them is, does this matter? Um, it's pretty hard to know. I, I guess it, in large part depends on how much we think politically stable, politically open Anglophone countries are representative of Africa as a whole. So I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not you think Ghana and South Africa are emblematic of the broader experience across the African continent. You may say yes, you may say no. You have your own ideas about that. I have my concerns about it, but I will leave it to you to decide for yourselves. Um, and it also depends on whether the phenomena under study is affected by uh, social, political, and economic context. Again, this, this gets back to the questions I posed about the fish earlier. If you're interested in the fish just as organisms, it probably doesn't matter. If you're interested in the governance systems that, that affect whether or not that fish will become extinct or continue to be a commercially viable uh, source of income for the country and, for, uh, and a source of local food security, it might matter a lot. <coughs> uh, and I'll give you an example of one of the ways in which it might matter. Uh, okay, so we've been talking about climate change. Uh, this is an excerpt from the IPCC uh, AR5 Working Group 2 chapter on Africa. I'm going to read it for you because that's way more text than you should ever put on a presentation slide. There has been progress in Africa in implementing and researching community-based adaptation with broad agreement that support the local level adaptation is best achieved by starting with existing local adaptive capacity and incorporating and building upon present coping strategies and norms, including indigenous practices. Okay. This is something that the, pe that the people writing the IPCC, the authors of that chapter, assessed to have that, that it was a finding in which they had high confidence. So that there was a lot of consensus in the literature about this. The evidence for that statement is entirely drawn from I think, tw 12 studies, nine of which occurred in former British colonies. So to the extent that, um, uh, let, me, let me just back up and, and just kind of put that in, in sort of human terms, right? That means that 75% of the evidentiary basis for this claim is drawn from countries that together account for less than 20% of the population of Africa. Is that a problem? I think it probably is, and I can't tell you the magnitude of it. The next part of this kind of line of inquiry is finding out what happens if we resample. If we say, okay, let's make a more balanced sample and only look at the same number of countries randomly drawn, or the same number of, of studies randomly drawn from the Ang Anglophone Africa region as we have for the non-Anglophone Africa, African countries, and then compare across those two and see if our results differ. Okay. All right, so I posed a problem. So what's to be done about it? Well, again, I'm going to, for a moment, just speak directly to the scholars from the group in this area. Uh, the first thing is that we need to actually encourage our students to return to studying foreign languages and not just methods, um, especially in, uh, the, well, not just in the social sciences, but definitely in a lot of the harder sciences, there's less emphasis on equipping researchers with the kind of um, skills that will be necessary for them to operate in environments that are outside of their, of their comfort zone, that are outside of their native language. We just simply don't do a lot of that anymore, in part because we have moved in the direction of making sure that our students are as teched up uh, methodologically as possible. That's great, and we should continue to emphasize that kind of work, but we also need to emphasize the development of other types of skills and other types of networks that will allow them to work in a more diverse set of places. We need to encourage scholars to diversify their subjects. 
And unfortunately, when the rubber meets the road, is that that is going to mean rejecting otherwise sound studies and proposals. And that means it's going to be hard. At some level, the NSF is going to have to say to a well-meaning researcher, perhaps me, that's great. The study seems very well designed. We're glad that you have uh, the ability to implement this in Uganda, but we're all full up on Uganda right now. Come back to us if you'd like to do this in Mozambique. That will be hard. It will be hard which means because it will affect you as students. It will affect <coughs> myself as a student mentor and my prospects for publication. It will be a difficult thing for us as a scholarly community to do, but if we're serious about this, we have to do it. Another alternative is that we need to pay for translation. If one of the impediments here is simply the ability to communicate at a sufficiently high technical standard in English to publish in English for non-Anglophone uh, or non-English speaking researchers, we can pay for translation of the studies that they're doing in their own languages, either indigenous languages or in other colonial languages uh, for, for, for wider release so that they can gain a broader audience. And then the final thing is that we need to oversample non-Anglophone countries in meta-analyses. We need to account for the fact that there are many more of these studies so that when we're engaging in an enterprise like the IPCC was doing earlier, where they are taking a body of evidence and treating it as if it's representative of all the cases, we need to include fewer of the case of the studies that are drawn from these Anglophone countries relative to the smaller numbers of uh, studies that relate to non-Anglophone countries. What that literally means is saying, in the, in the earlier case, we had nine of, of the Anglophone ones, we had three of the non-Anglophone ones. We will only analyze three of the Anglophone ones and three of the non-Anglophone ones to minimize that kind of bias in the evidentiary data. Okay. What's to be done for practitioners and indeed for, for members of the public when they're interrogating the information that we generate as a community? I think there are three things here. There are probably more, but these are the three that I think are important. The first is to ask not just what is the evidence, but where is the evidence from? To be thoughtful and critical about the populations from which the evidence is drawn. The second is to be wary of studies that just discuss most popular or most publicized cases. Um, this has been an issue uh, that has, has really uh, come to the forefront uh, in the last couple of years because the, of the overwhelming influence that the case of the Syrian civil war has exerted <laughs> on the literature linking climate change and drought to political instability. Right. And I'd be happy to discuss that a little bit more in the q uh, And then finally, uh, I'm including practitioner in, in here practitioners people like the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of, National Institutes of Health, uh, and the, D the DOD and the Minerva Initiative uh, in this category. They need to keep investing and actually increase their investment in hard to study places. That is also going to be hard for researchers because one of the inescapable implications of my argument is that for us to get a more balanced picture of the world, people like me, people like you, have to put yourself at additional risk. And that is not a decision to be taken or treated lightly. Okay. All right, so um, you've already heard my three observations. And I, I'd like to, to end my formal comments uh, with what I hope is a call for discussion. So I've made the argument that what we know about climate change effects and adaptation there too is only as good and as generalizable as the cases we know about. That humans are creatures of habit and convenience, and that latter places limits on the former and those limits we don't acknowledge. Well, we've just spent the last few minutes trying to acknowledge them and trying to investigate them. So the call to action is, what will we do about it? All right. Um, thank you very much. You've been a great audience. This is part of my human network that got me going in Africa. That's ID. That's myself. That's Todd, one of Josh's students. That's Josh. Uh, Todd, uh, I think, is doing a lot of really great work on service delivery protests in, wait for it, South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate any comments or questions you might have. Yeah. Hi, please. Yes. Sorry. Hey, hey, could, could you tell me, we, it's a large group, so could you tell me who you are? And, um, sure. Yeah, great. That's great. Um, I'm a second year master's of <laughs> who studies student here. My name is Catherine. 
Um, I work with the Weaver and the International um, Innovations for Peace and Development project as well. So um, I had just a quick follow up because I didn't read quite. You used um, an, in an index. I couldn't even hear which one. Yeah, it's the Notre, Notre Dame, it's the ND Gain Index would be the way that you would find it mm -hmm. online. So what they are doing, are you, are you interested in kind of the construction of the index? Yes. Yeah, so it's, a, I mean, it's, it's relatively complicated, but this, is, this was generated by people who are primarily climatologists who are looking at future projections of things like sea level rise, uh, temperature increases, and they're integrating that with um, information about the structure of the economy, the types of crops that are grown there, et cetera, to try and come up with an assessment of how it is that future climate change is likely to impact uh, the human populations and the physical terrain. So they're actually, in, in, they're actually incorporating a lot of information from projections and also uh, information about current land use. Now, it's one way to measure this. There's another alternate um, index that, that, is, that is produced by, I think a man named Charles Wheeler, that's fairly commonly used in this space. I also tested these models using Wheeler's index and get brought in the same kind of results. I also read the subsection where you use civil liberties yes. as, is that in the same one? No, so the civil liberties is drawn from Freedom House. So Freedom House is a non-governmental organization um, that's actually funded in part by the US government. But it is, uh, what they do is that they collect data on civil liberties and media freedoms. Mm -hmm. So if you're familiar with this kind of free, partially free, not free categorization yes. as relates to media freedoms, that's where that's coming from. Is that a subsection or is that the whole index? Um, what I was using is the civil liberties component. Uh, they're, they're relatively highly correlated with one another, so that most of the places that are not free politically are also not free in terms of the free press and free speech. Yes. Um, but they are, they're not perfectly. For, the, for these purposes, it doesn't tend to matter a lot which of the subset parts of the index you use. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes, please. My name is Caleb Rudell. I'm actually an alumni, and I'm just coming back for a free food event. <laughs> it's good to be here. It's also great to hear a great speech. Um, so I'm interested in what you think about how this relates to where uh, development money is going. So if you think about the greatest number of good, and you think about probably one study that goes to a place where people might use that study for development, might be better than a study that goes to a place where it doesn't go. How do you think that affects your research? No, that, that's a great question, because th this relates to something that's really hard for me to get at using these kind of measures, which is a concept I guess I might call kind of, I mean, the development literature would call this absorptive capacity, right? So what that means is that does the marginal dollar invested there actually produce some good output? Um, and so that relates to whether or not we think that there are certain countries or political contexts where the provision of this information is actually going to inform better policy outcomes. So that could potentially be kind of a lurking issue. Um, I don't know what to say. I'm not sure that you sunk my battleship, but it, it is something that's very hard to kind of capture with these kinds of measures. So it might be interesting to include measures of kind of governance capacity or bureaucratic effectiveness if we think that those things would be correlated uh, with the use of, or the, the adoption and, and, and the implementation of, of new scientific evidence. Um, that's highly correlated with GDP per capita, even for this subset of countries. So I don't think it would alter the results much, but it, it would potentially give me a better opportunity uh, to, to address that in these other studies. So I'll, I'll think about incorporating that into the add-on studies that are not yet published in this area. Thank you. Yeah, Kate. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not helpful, actually. But sort of as a, a meta-evaluation methodological approach, mm -hmm. I'm interested in hearing more about your search protocol that you use in the literature review to find these studies. Because you mentioned Google. Mm -hmm. You didn't mention if you search Google in different languages mm -hmm. and whether or not Google's actually set up to capture things in non-English languages. Right. And then you choose three English-language journals, and then you chose yes. a Boston-based j mm -hmm. institution. So how did you sort of square that with, the findings there would automatically lead me to believe that the studies that you found mm -hmm. are necessarily gonna, gonna lead you to the results that they're English and focused on Anglophone countries. Right, so does my research on the streetlight effect suffer from the streetlight effect? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us more about your search protocol. I'm just telling you also, I have a bunch of students in the room mm -hmm. who just studied meta-evaluation techniques and evaluation right. methods, so I yes. want them to hear how it's tackled. Okay, great. So this was, this was a question that came up um, for me 
I'm, I'm glad you asked it because it's an incredibly important question. It, I'm also glad you asked it because it's one I actually had to think about and then think about how to respond to these kind of questions in the review process. So this definitely came up. Um, so, so one answer uh, to your question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the, the easy answer first and then I will give you the, the more kind of methodologically informed and empirically grounded answer. The first question is sort of if the tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it doesn't make a sound question. Mm -hmm. And that's simply that if you go back and look at the IPCC chapter on Africa about human uh, impacts, and impacts and adaptation, there are 900, I think, and 15 references. All but four of them are to English language sources. And two of the ones that are not English language sources are French translations of documents that were originally written in English. Um, okay, so that, that's one way of saying it. And I actually confirmed that by, by uh, personal correspondence with one of the lead authors on the Africa chapter. And what they said was, yes, we recognize that this is a problem. Um, as a research team, we decided that we could only do a systematic study of the English language literature on this subject. All right, which means that this is, this is actually evidence. I mean, this, that's, a, that's, a, that's as clear a possible kind of statement as you can get of the problem that I'm trying to interrogate here. So that's, that's one answer. The second question relates to whether, or the, the first question, or sorry, my second answer relates to the implicit question, which is, am I leaving out a huge chunk of the stock of knowledge about climate change impacts and adaptation in Africa by searching in English language sources? And the answer there uh, is not really. So I consulted with a, a, a variety of uh, Portuguese and French speakers uh, about studying the other kind of most commonly spoken, um, and Arabic for that matter, the other most commonly spoken languages, uh, and conducted similar searches. And the, the, the numbers of results that you would generate are not, uh, they're, they're several orders of magnitude smaller than the, than the total numbers that you saw here. Which, I, so that for every, for every thousand studies that are published in English, there might be one study published in Portuguese. Uh, and so that was something that I did try to address. Now, my, my, essentially, the argument that I, that I kind of relied upon in terms of the publication process was saying, well, if we're interested in what the international community is speaking as one via the IPCC report thinks about this phenomenon, uh, if we think that that's broadly representative, then I can use that as a little bit of a piece of evidence. But your, your, your broader question is one that is relevant, but not as relevant for this type of work as it might be for others. And that's simply because there's such strong, in part because of the way that the training works, but there's, and in part because of the kind of countries that have funded this kind of research uh, activity, one of the reasons why Austin's a global research university, they've just simply invested the most resources in studying these phenomena and studying them in English. So even if you are uh, you know, Mozambican and, and you are publishing in this area, you're likely to be publishing in English. Or, for that matter, if you're a Chinese researcher who's working in Africa and wants to publish your results, you're also likely to publish them in English as well. But that is something that we had to confront. I, I, I'm not sure the specific issues that your team is, is researching, but if I had a better idea of, 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 kind of the narrow subjects, I might be able to, to provide more thoughtful uh, response to that question. Thank you. So, yes, please. Hi. Uh, I'm Rehan. I'm a first year in the Master of Public Affairs to candidate here at LBJ. My question is that we know that a lot of research, as you have mentioned, has been clustered around in a few countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, but do we have a sense that whether the evidence that, been, that is being generated informs public policy of countries that are not part of that cluster? Do we have any sense uh, uh, to imagine? Right. So that, that's a great question. So. Um, for, for those, I, if I understand your question correctly, one, you know, one of the one of the potential not, not solutions to this problem, but maybe something that might not make the problem that bad, is that is if these other countries that are not being studied face similar problems as study, countries that are being studied, it might still provide useful information that you can use to, to help solve your problems. I don't have hard data on that because it's really difficult. You know, it's very difficult to know why it is that uh, um, a Policymaker, a team of policymakers would implement a particular um, you know, policy lever, or pull a particular policy lever, whether or not that's tied directly to the evidentiary basis. I think that the way that you would get at that, if you were really interested in that issue, would be to do something like either a poll of, of, of um, government uh, workers or minist uh, ministries in this area and see what they're using as an evidentiary basis. There are some models that we could 
that, that already exist that do this kind of thing that we could apply in this area. There may in fact be work there, although I'm not, I'm not familiar with it. Um, and I think that, you know, for, I guess the way I would respond now, based on my, my read of, of this literature, is that for certain things, yes. Um, if you have an endangered species of tree that's facing habitat loss because of a change in temperature, a change in precipitation, um, that exists both you know, on, on one side of the Renzori Mountains and, and on the other side. So what part of those trees are found in Uganda and those trees are found in DRC. It may be that there are uh, solutions or potential things you can do to reclaim um, uh, the um, uh, e ecological zone that, are, that you can just import directly from Uganda and implement in DRC. But if you're, if you're dealing with, with issues that are related to or interact with kind of local or national level governance institutions, it's almost impossible to know how well information garnered from one of those is going to, to work in another. So this is, this is the crux of the problem. And, I, and again, I, I wish I could tell you how large I thought that problem is. Unfortunately, I can't. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, in the back of the white shirt. Sorry. Sure. Um, um, thank you for coming today. Great talk. Uh, I have a question about um, sort of your optimism for the future in terms of changing uh, scholarship on this area. Mm -hmm. um, I just, um, as Kate was mentioning in, in her seminar, we just completed a synthesis evaluation of um, the scope of literature on next combatant reintegration. Okay. And the vast majority of countries studied were um, relatively easily accessible, relatively safe for research to be carried out. We're talking about um, Nepal, now Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Colombia. Um, obviously, there's a lot more excombatant integration programs than most other countries. Um, so we found a lot of gaps in that body of literature, just as you found with climate change. What is your level of optimism that scholarship can actually adapt to this bend the might approach, can actually recognize that there are greater needs that are not being approached? Um, well, you know, the, the, the first step in addressing a problem is recognizing that you have a problem. So I think that, you know, I, I think we're kind of there um, at this point, and not, and not necessarily because of the things that I've published. I think, I think that this is something that a lot of researchers grapple with, but there's been less of kind of a concerted attempt to hold a mirror up to the research community and say, this is actually the magnitude of the issue that you're dealing with. Um, so I think, that, I think that recognition may push, it, it's similar to recognition of other kind of um, unacknowledged biases uh, that we have as scientists. For, one, what, for instance, one of the unacknowledged biases is that research that's conducted, at least in the area of international affairs, by women tends to be cited less frequently than research that's conducted by men. That's bias that we can measure, and that's bias that we can now account for, and that's bias that we can take proactive steps to uh, ameliorate. Right? There's something that we can do about that. Similarly, I think that there are things that we can do about the nature of the problem we just identified here. The language barrier is striking as being less difficult to overcome than the, barrier, than the barriers related to political instability uh, and, and permissibility. A lot would have to change in Eritrea for you to be able to go to Eritrea uh, and, and conduct the types of studies that are being conducted routinely in, in Kenya, for instance. And so I'm optimistic that we can overcome the language hurdle um, just because of the advances in the real-time uh, digital uh, you know, computer-aided translation, uh, if, if nothing else is helping a lot in that area. And it's an area where we can, we can invest money in things like translation of scientific texts and scientific documents. The, the ones related to political instability uh, and, and permissibility of inquiry, I can't think of a very obvious solutions to. Although your, your question does give me an opportunity to mention something I should have mentioned earlier. If you're interested as a climate change researcher in things that can be studied via remote sensing, this is a lot less of a problem. Uh, in fact, remote sensing has also increased the detectability of things like human rights violations. So there are some phenomena that used to require kind of on the ground, uh, boots on the ground types of analysis that we are now able to conduct remotely. So for the subset of kind of scientific issues that you can study primarily via remote sense data, um, this is less of a problem. But for these really thorny kind of issues related to governance, local institutions, uh, the kind of things where you really need to be there, Th this remains a pretty significant problem. Uh, so I'll take your question and then your question. Okay, okay so uh, my name's Ryan. I'm a first year uh, global policy studi studies student. Um, 
what you were just talking about actually sort of goes well with what I was going to ask. I was going to ask, um, how does technological change either um, exacerbate or mitigate the street light effect? So, for example, the remote sensing uh, might be an example of uh, you know enhancing data collection and reducing street light effect, but something like um, like automated um, translation, so you could go and just use a tool, and it might dissuade you from actually learning the language. Did you just sort of speak to that? Right. Um, I, 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 I can make some guesses. Um, I think, you know, any, to the extent that automated translation is not an area that I've researched, to the extent that that's actually making communication easier. Um, it probably is going to affect most directly the ability to kind of collect primary data uh, rather than the ability to publish in another language. Um, because most of those tools are being developed around very kind of natural interactions uh, as opposed to being developed for the purely technical audience. The nice thing is that there are a lot of true cognates in technical uh, language across various languages so that there's some level of kind of uh, uh, mutual understanding. It's based on there. Um, you know, other kind of other technological advances that might provide a solution actually amplify this problem. You know, to the extent that uh, okay, here, here's a here's here's a potential way it might accelerate this problem. Um, so, an organization that Variety of us were involved with, uh, Aid Data um, at the College of William and Mary. Uh, was interested in essentially taking these kind of aid-based tools, or, or collecting uh, data on official development assistance, and then going out and teaching researchers uh, how to use these tools and better implement and better collect fine-grained data on um, where donor assistance is going and what it's doing. To the extent that these personal networks I was talking about and these linguistic issues mean that that data is being collected much better for a certain subset of countries, i.e. politically stable, relatively open, anglophone ones than it is for others, it could actually compound the problem simply because it will further increase the availability of data on those cases. Um, so I think that the, the technology, as with all technology, right, there are, there are going to be benefits and detriments that come along with it. And Douglas Adams was, right, was the one who wrote about the Babel fish being a cause of more conflict than all other technological innovations combined because it, Instantly made all human or all populations, both human and alien, able to communicate with one another. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's probably going to be a source of more cooperation and conflict. But some of these other technological interventions, I don't know. Yes, please. Um, so I'm, um, I'm Emily, first year global policy student. I'm interested in um, the social concern with the generalizability of the results of these studies. Would you talk a little bit about? why you chose the state as a unit of analysis when right. cultural and climatic differences within states might mean the results obtained for one part of that state might not be generalized even for the rest of the country? Sure. Yeah, so I, I, was, I was talking uh, with the editor of uh, food policy, uh, agricultural economist by the name of Mark Belmer, and I was describing to him the kind of work that I was doing. He said, oh yeah, I call that the Buzia effect. So there's this county in Kenya, Kenya Buzia County. There's, there's a Buzia County in Uganda too, but he was referring to Buzia in Kenya. They have a local government facility there that essentially helps researchers conduct agricultural economic research. Uh, and so it, it was so common that researchers would go there because that was one of the places a lot of these initial studies were conducted. They eventually opened a government facility that would help facilitate future uh, research in that area. So this is, this is probably a big issue subnationally as well. Um, I didn't go to that level of data collection. So I was, I was looking at mostly at the country level um, primarily, again, as a matter of convenience, at least at this point. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's no reason to, to believe that this doesn't exist for subnational groupings. In the paper, I talk a little bit about the way in which this affects uh, those phenomena that are transboundary in nature. And I looked at it oh, as, a, as kind of a diagnostic. I looked at the number of references in these journals to different river basins in Africa. So you have some that are primarily like the, the Niger River Basin, which is flowing through a mixture of Anglophone and Francophone in Africa. You have some like uh, the Limpopo River, which is flowing almost entirely through Anglophone in Africa. And you see a similar pattern. Um, and so it, it, it is a phenomenon that affects research on particular countries. It's also a phenomenon that affects research on these transboundary types of phenomena, at least that one. Um, and so 
that, so far that's the only answer I can give. But I think I think if you went looking, and this is this is how it's been for me. Once once I sort of opened my eyes or was made aware of this kind of problem, it all of a sudden dawned on me that I began seeing it virtually everywhere. I'm before. Yeah, um, Josh, and then. So one way I, I think I've tried to counteract this in some more recent work in India and China is uh, working with local scholars who have either better language capability or more local knowledge, then that helps you know, both address kind of inequalities and in kind of representation in scholarship, where it's like you know, American scholars doing work on places that they aren't from. But, but, but it, uh, so I think that's, that's something that we can do, but there also seems to be ways in which the U.S. government, for example, is maybe drawn to try and uh, address some of these problems because of the salience of the issue, like uh, uh, Somalia as a frequent hotspot for either piracy or famine or Ni northern Nigeria, Boko Haram. The, the, the challenge, though, it seems to me that uh, I'm not sure if, if we systematically develop really good research as a, as a driven by those kind of policy interests. Uh, we've seen the recent um, uh, case of the uh, attack in Niger, and, I, and it seems to me that we actually don't know very much about that particular place at all. Maybe that's just a function of the streetlight effect in, in operation, but I'm wondering how we can take what we do know uh, about, say, uh, climate and conflict uh, and apply it to the place that we actually haven't studied very much. Um, uh, Tom Friedman had a piece in the New York Times that kind of had some hand wavy uh, sort of uh, associations that he thought that climate was the main driver of that particular conflict, and, or at least one of the major drivers, and it left me deeply dissatisfied. But I didn't know what to do with it in light of the fact that we haven't really studied that region all that much. Yeah. Um, so I, I agree completely that, that one of the best tools for solving this, um, th this is a true, this is true of sort of the, the general imbalance of the fact that you have parts of the world that are being researched intensive, intensely and, fun and research that is being funded intensely by people from other parts of the world. And so one of the, the this kind of peer-to-peer -peer interaction in research teams is obviously one way of getting around this, which is why as we've moved into this more kind of food security, um, Lake Victoria kind of space, we've, we've begun working very collaboratively with research scientists at the various national research institutions there. So they're co-authors and providing inputs for the analysis on, 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 our, on our studies. Um, the second question, you know, I think relates to the, the problem that you have something, something kind of flares up as an issue and especially if it occurs in an area we don't study much, you find out pretty quickly you have a pretty thin bench in terms of experts who can go out and, and, and inform uh, the way that you think about these things. And in the policy community, to a certain extent, the thing that funded all of our original research, the Minerva Initiative, uh, on these topics on, on, on political stability and climate change in Africa was funded in, in direct response to the realization that there were a variety of places that the US military and US national security interests were gravitating toward about which the existing stock of knowledge and research could not tell us much. And so I think there's opportunity there. I, I want to be very careful how I'm using the term opportunity. I think that, that, that that can be good. It's unfortunate that we need those kinds of drivers as warrants for the claim that we should be interested in other places. Um, but it does provide some opportunity. The danger, I think, is in whether or not, and this relates, again, kind of to the inside baseball parts of the profession, the danger is if there's really kind of episodic interest in some place uh, that does not endure over time, and you have students doing research on that hot topic, and then that topic becomes cold, and then all of a sudden um, you have people who are, are not able to continue their, their careers. So there's a lot of inherent kind of conservatism, I think, amongst the research community to keep gravitating back to these places that they know there will be consistent interest in for the foreseeable future because there are already a lot of people working in that area. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think that that's one of the, one of the problems that keeps us, um, that, that and just the time lags in terms of generating real good research on these types of topics, that keeps us from being able to more instantaneously inform kind of policy hotspots as they emerge.
Um, but this is something that's been really significant in the discussion about the role of climate change and drought in the Syrian conflict. Uh, that, that that really caught purchase in you know, the popular press. It, it was thinking that emerged first from scholars and think tanks, but then was advanced forward really quickly in the popular press by people like Thomas Friedman, or like President Obama, and by a variety of documentary filmmakers that essentially made this argument in a very forceful way before we had a very robust body of scientific literature about those, the claims that they were making. Uh, and that's meant that, that many of the people who are making the most kind of strident arguments that climate change had caused the Syrian conflict have had to walk those things back recently. Uh, yes, you have a question. So I, thanks very much for your talk. Um, my name is James Stevenson. I'm a resident scholar with IPD. Um, I work for an organization called CGIR, which is has campuses across the African continent. Um, I wanted to make a few points in, in response to your talk. So forgive me if it's, uh, I've, I've been thinking a lot about exactly these topics for a very long time, and it's great to see it all put together in one, one talk. So I think, I think the key mechanism, one of the key mechanisms to, to explain your results, I really do think is, is, is the families, the families of researchers. So I, Reflecting on my own experience over 15 years, I, I had to promise my mom when I went to do my PhD fieldwork in the Philippines, I would not do fieldwork in Mindanao. <laughs> uh, I, I would, I, I could go to Luzon, I could go to Western Visayas, but she she made me swear I wouldn't go to Mindanao. I had to stick there. <laughs> and and then subsequently, working for Oxfam, uh, there was a definite cultural divide, and that's the kind of sink one on of, of a British ex ex British colonial institution perpetuating exactly these kinds of things. Uh, complete cultural divide between those people who worked on development and did the long-term stuff in exactly the kind of countries that you're talking about, and the humanitarian department. And the development was very much about people, they were, they were professionals that maybe been in the job for a long time, they had kids, they worried about their own personal safety. Mm -hmm. The risk aversion was much greater than people that populated the humanitarian department. They didn't engage with the research community in the same way. They were much, typically much younger. They didn't have kids. They were lived out of the suitcase, ready to go all the time. They had a greater preference for, for those kinds of risks. And then if you play that into now my, my experience with the CG, what I see with the campuses across, across the continent, there's this kind of selection process that takes place uh, where I think the best research takes place in places like Nairobi, in Addis, in, uh, in Dar, in Kampala, where there's a critical mass of people that want to be there to provide a certain then level of institutional capacity to support them. Uh, there may be schools for their kids to go to if they are expatriates. And places like Niame, and places like Burkina, uh, Mozambique, there are spots of people that it, for, for a combination of both, I think, uh, personal interest and willingness to put yourselves into those difficult places, combined with the donor dimension, which I think is also important too. Um, I think there's a real issue about being able to do good research and the quality of the research and having people like yourselves having counterparts that are good and that have that are strong and that have been there for a long time. And that's not to downplay the national partners. But I think, again, in the case of Uganda, um, I don't know if you've read Morton Jerland's book on, on poor numbers, you know, that UBOS, the Ugandan Bureau of Statistics, stands out as a kind of shining beacon of hope. Yeah, they are good. And I think that's a really important dynamic in so certainly supporting work that we've been doing with the World Bank. That, that you just can't do very much working with a local partner that has very limited capacity. And so that's why they've had much more entry to Uganda while working in these years, being much more difficult and so on. So they, there's a lot of mechanisms that I think can explain your result. Um, I'm completely by your results, by the way. I mean, absolutely. Um, but I think then what we do about it is very problematic and very deep and very structural. I think it's very, there are potentially trade-offs with being able to do good research. And I was going to pick up on Caleb's point exactly about having a having an entry point to in order to do good through research. First you have to do good research and then you have to have an institution that's going to take on take on your results. Um, and also I just want to make one more point about the French academic tradition as well. I think the, there's an outside influence uh, obviously from the French colonial institutions and, and on the continent 
relative to the amount of good quality academic research that's done uh, in French language institutions. So I've, I've worked in the past with CIRAD, which is the recipient of a lot of government money in France for doing agricultural research for development uh, in Africa. And there's just not the same culture of publishing in good journals. The, the focus is much more about immediate development and this kind of is a shift for in, in the development to research continuum. The focus is much more on generating usable knowledge in the short term that's then actionable and it doesn't get published. And so there are people working in Mauritania, there are people working in um, Cote d'Ivoire, whatever, that, that are doing stuff that could be interesting but they just don't publish. And, and there's not the same pressure and expectation for them. They all have job security, they don't need to worry about it. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, complex historical dynamics that, that explain this um, and several mechanisms, but only goes to reinforce your main finding. Well, thank you. I mean, that, that, it's really great to hear your perspective on this because I think that one of the things that's very difficult to do in the context of a talk like this is to, other than giving my own experience, rather than talking about my story, is to, to kind of flesh out all of the little individual kind of <laughs> obvious but the non-obvious things. Like the, the, the point that you mentioned about is there, is there infrastructure to support a large enough expat community that you have this agglomeration of minds working in these areas. Yeah, I mean, there's, we, have, we have essentially like a scaleless, you know, um, you know, a scale independent kind of infor information infrastructure in the United States where you should be able to do good research from anywhere and yet people still flock to Cambridge, Massachusetts to be around other people who are working, doing cutting edge work in this area, right? Um, and so if, it, if, that, if that effect occurs in sort of one of the, essentially the well most well-funded, the largest and most diverse kind of university uh, cultures at a country level in the world, we would expect that those effects would be much more dramatic uh, for many countries in the developing world. Um, and then this point on kind of doing good research, I, I think that when I, I've given this talk to an audience that had a lot of people who are coming from uh, you know, a, a traditional post-colonial theory uh, and also a tradition of um, uh, more, more sociologists and anthropologists. And their responses were overwhelmingly, well, yeah, we know all of this. Um, and, and that's because their, their idea of what constitutes good work in many circumstances is not work that needs to leverage the type of data sources that many of the people who want to publish in the American Journal of Agri Agricultural Economics would need to leverage. I mean, they will go study Kenya because they say, I need data, I need, you know, I need cadastres, and I need land use data going back to the 1960s in order to answer this question. And I'm not going to find that you know, in chat, right? Um, I'm going to find that in Kenya, maybe. And so, um, you know, for it, it's odd because one of the things I've sort of noticed in, in my interactions with some of uh, the folks in this community, including a, a collaborator of mine who's just who's leaving academia and transitioned to working for GIZ, so she'll be working with the German Development Agency. She's a development economist, but she's not doing work that looks like the work that comes out in these types of journals. It's good, it's practical, and it's useful knowledge for addressing sort of quotidian kind of development issues but it doesn't necessarily look like the kind of work that comes out in the top line journals that I'm searching in here, which is something that you pointed out as well. So that's been my experience too. I'm not, I haven't, I haven't tried to interrogate kind of different sort of col uh, different, different colonizers and different research traditions within them. Um, that could obviously make for some fun interactions <laughs> uh, at conferences, uh, but, I'm, but I might try to do that going forward. But thank you very much for your interventions. That was, that was very useful. Yes. Have you been able to find funding and support for this research? Um, the good news is this type of research, at least thus far, doesn't require a lot of funding because it's the kind of thing, I mean, I have RAs who work on it, but they are presumably binge watching Netflix and searching on Google <laughs> Scholar. It's pretty much, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty great job, actually, now that I think about it. But um, yeah, th this, to do it at that scale doesn't require a lot of funding. To do what, what some have suggested, which is to look subnationally or look transnationally, um, might be significantly more in, um, kind of intensive. There are ways that you could write. You could write scrapers that could do some of this, but Google Scholar hates it when you do things like that, and it will kick you out. So actually, you'd, you'd have to write a scraper that also had an automated break to make it approximate a human. It'd be cheaper, but it would take the same amount.
think on that note, let's uh, give a round of applause.